Our environmental policies, that's for Shell, are the same everywhere else in the world. We have global standards which we subscribe to, our operational practices. We also comply not only with international laws, but we comply with the local laws of every country. So even when the local laws may be lower, we still apply by global standards because we're a global company and our operations in every part of the world is expected to be the same. That is what our stakeholders expect from us, that is what our investors expect from us, and that is what we demand for ourselves. The problem of crude oil theft is something that is really much out of the control of the operators. It creates huge problems, not just for the operators, but for the environment and the people of the Niger Delta, the innocent victims who are also victims of the act of a lot of the criminals that actually do these things. But the oil industry on its own, we commit to cleaning up the spills, wherever, whatever the cause, whether it's caused by sabotage, whether it's caused by anything, human error, equipment failure, we commit to cleaning up. We also commit to making sure that spills that are caused by operational reasons or equipment failure are eliminated. But the real tragedy is the uncontrolled spill of oil by people who want to st steal oil from crude pipelines. That is the one that is really causing a human tragedy in the Niger Delta today. I started my engineering apprenticeship in a place called Glenfield and Kennedy and from there moved on to college and then further on to marine engineering in Inverness of all places and then moved down to Aberdeen to work in the offshore industry which I was offshore for about 10 years and in that time of 10 years offshore things had changed dramatically. I really had moved on, become more safe and it was it was a, a pretty good industry to work in. Obviously, the financial situation improved. And then, as it developed in Aberdeen, the projects started to come in Africa, and I was involved in West Africa. And that was an eye-opener, because they were just put back about 20 years in the health and safety issues, and the work practices, etc., was just an eye-opener. And uh, I feel really sorry for the, the local people because they're only treated in the same respect as to the expats and the people that were running the installations over there. And uh, it was a hard thing to, to actually um, to live with, um, trip in, trip out. But uh, it was a thing you just had to go on with. But again, you, you felt really sorry for it, that these people would seem to be um, exploited in a bad way. And, uh, and the very thing in, uh, in, in Scotland, especially Aberdeen area, you've got a hail background of engineering to fall back on. So if anything went wrong, you had this great infrastructure that was already existing through um, people that were, that were ex-workers in shipyards and heavy engineering. Over in the west coast of Africa, there was nothing like that. Uh, so everything was really brought into that area to help run the oil industry. So the offshoot of that was, they didn't seem to be an awful lot of the, the finances, rewards that were made by the oil being put into the local areas. There was no big workshops, for instance, or anything like that, you get jobs done. Everything seemed to be taken over there to do a job and then taken back, which was a great disappointment, as I think the, even nuts and bolts, for instance, were taken from Europe or America and taken over to the rig, things were fixed and that's how it was. There was no local suppliers except for food sometimes and things like that. So uh, the infrastructure I felt when I was there wasn't getting built up the same as what it is here in the UK, in Scotland in particular. The um, pollution activities in uh, Niger Delta, I can broadly divide it into two. One, by the operation of the people who are exploiting this oil, which means the oil companies themselves, uh, their oil sites, the rigs. And the other one is by transportation. In that way, the oil companies are equally involved, and as well, those who do oil bunkering are involved. And another source of the other part of pollution can also come from the industries. Sometimes they have oil waste and all that, and they just uh, empty it into the river. So the two are the broad sources of environmental hazard from the oil companies themselves and as well from those who use oil, either directly or through means of transportation.
Yeah. The part of uh, bulk of it is blamed on the oil companies because sometimes they relax their policies. I, I, I can bet that they have good policies, both the oil operating companies and the government. But at some point they are relaxed when it comes to implementation and this is the major problem we have. For example of that is pipeline. You can have a pipeline designed to last for 22 years and at the end of that 22 years, instead of the company to go for replacement, they will leave it like that. And you can uh, have rust and other uh, infrastructural failures resulting in oil leaks and pipeline breakage. Though that, is not entirely explain, that does not entirely explain that uh, fact, but you have other points like oil vandalism, which is highly politicized. Sometimes the communities can invade it. Sometimes it's even sponsored by people that are in government or in these oil companies as well. The reason this is highly sabotaged is because if there is an oil leak from a pipe, the first person to blame would be the owner of the pipe. But because they don't want to own up this responsibility, they blame those from the communities. And the, the dialogue or conflict between these, what suffers is the environment at the end of the day.